In Nostran Sevia, the saber-toothed swamp cat, it's the late Permian period, about 252 million years ago, the world is dry, brutal, and dying. Yet, out in the vast floodplains of what is now Russia, something moves. Meet Inostran Sevia, a top predator that looks like someone took a saber-toothed cat, removed the fur, and then said, make it walk like a lizard. It wasn't actually an amphibian, more of a mammal-like reptile. But in this transitional age, labels get fuzzy. Inostran Sevia was three meters long, with dagger-like teeth up to 12 centimeters, perfectly built to slice through flesh. Think of it as nature's test run before cats and wolves. Its skull was massive, ridged with muscle attachments like armor plating. It hunted Scutosaurus, a walking tank we'll meet next, and when prey was scarce, likely turned on its own kind. The air it breathed was thin, the ground cracked and dying as Earth approached the greatest extinction in history. Yet, Inostran Sevia didn't care. It was built for desperation, lean, cunning, and relentless. If you saw one today, you'd freeze, partly from fear, partly from confusion. It's not quite a mammal, not quite a reptile, but 100% nightmare fuel, the last emperor of the Permian swamps. And when the extinction came, the great dying that wiped out 90% of life, Inostran Sevia perished too but not before leaving behind the blueprint for all future land predators. Scutosaurus, the armored couch potato. While Inostran Sevia prowled, its favorite chew toy lumbered across the baked plains, Scutosaurus, the shield lizard. Imagine a hippo wearing a medieval suit of armor. Now make it slower. Scutosaurus was a four meter long herbivore, thick as a truck with a body blanketed in bony plates that glinted like mosaics under the Permian sun. It lived in herds, trudging through fern-filled lowlands in search of plants. Because, yes, there were plants, just mostly the kind that would scratch your throat on the way down. Scutosaurus wasn't fast, wasn't smart, and probably couldn't see very far. But it had one advantage, defense. Its armor made it nearly invincible to smaller predators. Only apex killers like Inostran Sevia could take one down, and even then, it wasn't easy. Picture a lion trying to eat a moving ottoman covered in spikes. When Scutosaurus wasn't getting hunted, it probably spent its time wallowing near water holes, chewing cycads, and trying to stay cool. Despite its dopey look, Scutosaurus was a survivor a living tank that thrived until the planet collapsed around it. Then came the Permian extinction. Dust blotted out the sun, oceans turned toxic, and the great armored herds finally fell. But in a poetic twist, Scutosaurus's lineage paved the way for future armored giants, from ankylosaurs to armadillos. In the end, it wasn't the sharpest or the fastest that survived, just the luckiest. And Scutosaurus, tragically, ran out of luck. All right, I will be posting more videos here. So slam that like button, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. This helps us to rank better in the YouTube algorithm. Tiktaalik, the one that crawled. Now we rewind way back, 375 million years ago, to a humid Devonian swamp, where Tiktaalik flops onto land for the first time. This isn't just another fish. This is the fish. The evolutionary troublemaker who decided water was overrated. Tiktaalik looked like a cross between a crocodile and a fish with eyebrows. It had gills and lungs, fins and proto-limbs strong enough to prop up its chest. Its head was flat, eyes on top, the hallmark of an ambush predator lurking in the shallows. Picture it lying motionless under murky water waiting for a hapless arthropod to wander too close. Then, snap. In one gulp, evolution took a step closer to walking. Tiktaalik was the amphibian prototype, the first creature to truly test the land. Its fins contained bones. Humerus, radius, ulna, the same ones in your arm. 
You're looking at your ancestor, and it's flopping around in mud. It didn't exactly walk onto land triumphantly. It probably belly flopped its way onto shore, gasping and regretting everything. But over millions of years, its descendants would refine the technique, giving rise to frogs, salamanders, reptiles, and eventually, you. So, next time you use your hands to pick up your phone, remember Tiktaalik, the fish who invented elbows. Demetrodon, the sail-backed tyrant. If prehistoric Earth had an album cover, Demetrodon would be on it. It's the early Permian. 295 million years ago, a vast desert sprawls across what's now Texas, and stalking through it comes a creature that looks like a dragon straight out of heavy metal art. Demetrodon, a four-meter-long predator with a massive sail on its back. The sail was made of elongated spines connected by skin, like a solar panel fused to a crocodile. It wasn't just for show. It helped regulate body temperature. Morning chill, turn to the sun, midday heat, face away, thermoregulation, Permian style. Despite its reptilian look, Demetrodon wasn't a dinosaur. It wasn't even a reptile by modern standards. It was a synapsid, closer to mammals. In other words, your great-great-great-grandfather might have looked like this if he had fangs and a sail. Its skull was sculpted for killing, a wide gape with serrated teeth that could shred through armor and bone. Demetrodon hunted amphibians, smaller reptiles, and anything unlucky enough to move slower than it did. And that sail? Scientists still debate its purpose. Temperature control, mating display, intimidation, maybe all of the above. Either way, it worked. Nothing else dared challenge it. When it stood over its prey, back arched and sail glinting in the sun, Demetrodon looked less like an animal and more like the first rock star of evolution. Arrogant, efficient, and utterly terrifying. Coelacanth, the living fossil. While Demetrodon strutted on land, far below the waves lurked something far older. Coelacanth, the ghost fish of deep time. This creature first appeared around 400 million years ago, and against all odds, it's still here. Yes, you can find it today, lurking off the coasts of South Africa and Indonesia. Coelacanths are living fossils, two-meter-long, lobe-finned fish with stubby fins that move like little legs. They were thought extinct for 66 million years until a fisherman pulled one up in 1938 and broke paleontology's collective brain. In prehistoric oceans, they were predators of the deep, slow but patient hunters, drifting through volcanic reefs like silent submarines. Their scales are thick as armor, their movements eerily graceful. In a world ruled by chaos, Coelacanths mastered one thing, staying the same. While everything else evolved, died, or turned into a bird, Coelacanth just didn't. It found perfection early and refused to move on. Kind of like your uncle who still listens to vinyl exclusively, it breathes with a unique internal system, has an ancient hinge in its skull that lets it open its mouth absurdly wide and glows under UV light. Nature really overachieved here. Seeing one alive today is like watching a fossil swim. The coelacanth is proof that survival isn't always about change. Sometimes, it's about patience. Meganura, the dragonfly of nightmares. Now, let's take to the skies. Picture a dragonfly. Now make it the size of a seagull. That's Meganura, the largest insect to ever fly. About 300 million years ago, during the Carboniferous period, Earth's atmosphere was thick with oxygen, over 30%, compared to today's 21%. That surplus turned bugs into monsters. Meganura's wingspan stretched nearly three feet. Its compound eyes were massive, its mandibles sharp enough to tear through other insects. This was the T-Rex of the skies, a living drone of death. It hunted millipedes, amphibians, and anything small enough to fit in its spiny grasp. When it swooped through the dense jungles of giant ferns and horsetails, 
its wings would have made a dry, papery hum, the last sound a smaller creature ever heard. It didn't have lungs. Insects breathe through tubes. So the oxygen-rich air was a lucky break. When oxygen levels later dropped, so did the mega-insects. Evolution handed in their eviction notice. If you saw Meganeura today, it would look fake. Too big to be an insect, too alien to be real. Yet for millions of years, it ruled the skies like a silent predator, a symbol of an age when even bugs could be terrifying. Tanistrophius, the neck that shouldn't exist. We're in the Middle Triassic now, 240 million years ago, and evolution has started getting experimental. Meet Tanistrophius, a creature so bizarre, it looks like someone stretched a lizard in Photoshop. It had a body barely two meters long and a neck three times that. Ten feet of neck, supported by only a dozen elongated vertebrae. Scientists first thought they found a flying reptile, then a snake, then finally realized, no, it's just neck. Tanistrophius lived in coastal lagoons, using its absurd proportions to hunt fish from the shoreline. It could stay motionless, its head hovering over the water like a periscope, waiting for prey to swim close. Then snap, instant ambush. Its long neck wasn't flexible. It was more like a rigid fishing rod. So once it struck, it had to reel the prey in awkwardly, like a crane trying to eat sushi. Despite the impractical design, it thrived for millions of years. Evolution doesn't always reward elegance. Sometimes, it just rolls with weird but works. Tanistrophius proves that prehistoric life didn't always make sense. And that's what makes it fascinating. Dunkleosteus, the armored guillotine. Now we end deep underwater in the Devonian seas, 360 million years ago, where the undisputed terror of the ocean lurks. Dunkleosteus. Imagine a fish the size of a bus, covered in metal plates, with jaws that could bite through bone like butter. This thing didn't have teeth. It had bone blades, sharpened by evolution into a guillotine. It could open its mouth in a fraction of a second, creating a vacuum that sucked in prey. When it snapped shut, the force was nearly 8,000 pounds per square inch, enough to shear through anything unfortunate enough to be nearby. Its head alone was armored like a tank turret, while the rest of its body was likely flexible, propelling it through the murky seas of an Earth that was still inventing complex ecosystems. Dunkleosteus didn't eat. It obliterated. It fed on sharks, fish, and other Dunkleosteus. Because why stop at the competition? For 20 million years, it was the undisputed apex predator, until abruptly, it vanished. Maybe the seas changed, maybe its prey evolved too fast, or maybe even monsters have expiration dates. If it swam today, every beach sign would read, Do not enter, fish will eat boat. Dunkleosteus was nature's first experiment in overkill, a prehistoric reminder that sometimes evolution just says, Yeah, let's make this one horrifying. If you've watched to this point, slam that like button, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. This helps us to rank better in the YouTube algorithm.